Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Jamie McDonald checking in here with my good buddy, Justin, from the camera shop of Muskegon. Uh, I'm going to let Justin take over the mic here and kind of talk about what today is going to be. Uh, so today, uh, I, number one, I want to thank Jamie for uh, allowing us and uh, reaching out to us to uh, do a live broadcast. Uh, as you guys know, we're all practicing social distancing, so it makes it hard to uh, uh, you know, connect with each other. So we're trying to do the best we can. And I know there was a lot of people who uh, were scheduled to do Jamie's, uh, uh, like, was it one wandering lakeshore uh, yeah. workshop? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, since that was canceled, uh, we thought like, hey, this would be a good opportunity to, uh, to, to do something like this. So this is a live Q&A with, uh, with Jamie McDonald. And uh, we invite you guys to ask your questions and, you know, we'll, we'll take it from there. And of course, if I missed anything, Jamie, don't, don't hesitate to fill in the, the blanks. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm wondering if I'm still coming in. I see that you're frozen, Jamie. Are you, are you frozen? Oh, buddy. Let's do this. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> right. Uh, we go. Yeah, I'm ready to go. All right. Good deal. Yeah, I don't know. It looks like StreamYard bombed out. I guess we're probably not the uh, only people trying to do some sort of a live broadcast today. I think, sure. I think everybody's living in the world. <laughs> Type and Zoom and, and all of that. So. Uh, yeah. it's weird. I usually don't have any sort of internet issues at my house either. So I think it was just on StreamYard's end. So well, but, and I and I and I tried to open up um I did try to open up our Facebook page, so I got off of that as well. And I'll go on the 4G here on my uh cell phone too. So okay. Oh I it bombed out again. This is so weird. You, it keeps freezing and cutting out. I don't know what's going on. Can you hear me on your side still? Yeah, I can. You're very stuttery and and slow motiony looking over there. But then again, I'm hosting it on my end, so I don't know if it's because my video looks great over here. So I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and my video looks good over here. <laughs> okay, so it's definitely on Streamyard side for sure. Okay, so uh, I guess we could kind of just jump in a little bit and just see if anybody has any questions that they wanted to bring to the table today. Um, now is the time to do it. I know I did a little post last night uh, just talking to, to people out there to throw out some questions if they've got any. I see that. Yeah, Mike Hedge is asking, um, you know, he, he wants to get out and shoot, but at the same time, he wants to respect the authorities and not set a poor example. And he's asking, are you guys venturing out and um or he's staying pretty close to home. Um, so I'll let you, I'll let you take that one first, Jamie, if you'd like. 
Sure. So I have been venturing out, but mostly within the confines of my vehicle. So I'm avoiding, you know, public places, things like that. I think it's pretty safe to say you can, you know, go for a Sunday drive if you want. I don't, I don't think that anybody's too opposed to that. It's just avoiding the, you know, the big social gatherings or, you know, just staying away from places that are densely populated. I'm avoiding stores and things like that at all costs. So, uh, Country roads for me, if you live here in Michigan, that's pretty easy to accomplish. I don't think anyone's more than a few minutes drive from getting outside of a town or a city and enjoying the countryside. So that's what I've been doing. And uh, there is a, a piece of property with wooded trails on it um, just outside of my town and went out there yesterday to do a little bit of shooting to play with the new Olympus 12 to 45. And when I got out there, I was the only car there and i get out of my truck i go around to the passenger side to get all my gear out and within two minutes like three other cars pull up a family rides up on their bikes so i just kind of waited for those people to see where they were going and i just headed in the opposite direction and just it's pretty easy to social distance if you're out in the woods or if you're out on trails somewhere for the most part so that's what i've been doing looks like richard's been doing the same thing as well just staying away from people that's kind of what i'm doing yeah, and uh, myself, I I know that I'm still working at the store, working minimal hours, and uh, I've been getting out uh, and walking my dog because I take my dog to work now because, like, who else can I socialize with but him? So I'll I'll go and take a walk with him after you know from like three to five, and you know I I guess I'm not as concerned as some other people are. But uh, I, I know, like, ran into somebody who's uh, uh, the husband of one of our good customers on a on a bike trail, and he goes, "Oh, six feet now, six feet." Right. So, um, and that's something that it, it that takes a lot of getting used to. But I've I've been getting out to shoot a little bit. I shot uh, on Friday before um, before the weekend, so mm. took my camera with me. So I would I haven't ventured too far. I know that one of my good friends, Tim is, you know, he lives pretty close to the lake and he's just been uh, bopping down around uh, Pierre Marquette and stuff like that, but not going too far mm -hmm. um, away from home. Yeah. That's just be aware of your surroundings, you know, try not to touch things that you think other people may have come in contact with at any point in time that was recent, you know, just be aware, just be aware of your surroundings and kind of stick to yourself and do your thing. I think, uh, for a lot of people, photography is sort of a solitary venture anyways. So this probably isn't too different for some people. Uh, I'm probably a little bit different than most, though. I like to hang out in a group, at least with a few people, and shoot. Because I like to talk as much as I do shoot, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it definitely is definitely is different. But, you know, it, I, I think it's a solitary thing, too. But I'd like to go out and adventure with someone. And that's... Mm -hmm. um, you know, like my, my buddy, Tim or buddy, Kenny, just you kind of go out with someone and, and go shoot. And you can maintain that, that distance anyway, because normally you're over here shooting something and somebody shooting something right. over there. So right. it's not too hard to do. For sure. So I see John Thomas has a question um, regarding shooting video and microphones. He's asking for recommendations for microphone for better sound. Uh, so it's funny. We had this conversation yesterday, Justin and I did talking about audio and all things audio and video. And, um, I, I love the road products. Uh, I have the road video mic go. It's the one that's, it receives power from the camera itself. They make a video mic pro. I think it is that actually has uh, its own power supply. So it's amplified and those are shotgun mics that mount to the top of your camera in the hot shoe, uh, in the hot shoe up there on the top of your camera and road also makes uh, a great wireless setup lavalier and i think justin uses that at the store maybe yeah i'm actually using that right now to do this um i'm using the the road link set and that's uh that's wireless and the reason i do that is like right now you know i'm i'm hooked up right here and um uh, outside of using that i do use the video mic pro r um, if I want to use a shotgun mic, um, mm -hmm. but I find that the the lavalier just gives you a little bit more freedom. Sure. And uh, if if I want to have if I have a presenter coming in the store like yourself, um, I would hook you up with this and mm -hmm. just plug you into a speaker somewhere, so that way you know you there's there's just better sound people can hear you. Right. So another thing too, John, when it 
comes to audio with your video. It depends on the end results and what you're doing exactly. So uh, in the situation where you're doing interviews and things like that, I personally like a lavalier because the lavalier just tends to isolate the speaker's voice and gets rid of background noises pretty effectively. Shotgun mics, uh, while they're directional and you're pointing them you know, at your subject, I tend to find that I hear a little more ambient noise coming through a shotgun mic. And it's good and bad either way. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because I did a video years ago about macro photography and I shot it out in the woods and I was wearing a lavalier mic the whole time I was doing it. And I got done, I put the video together, put it up on YouTube and just started watching it, you know, just to kind of see how the finished product looked. And I realized I'm out in the woods and it sounds like I'm in a studio. There's no breeze. There's no rustle in the trees. There's no bird chirping in the background. There's nothing. It's very sterile and quiet versus where I had, you know, I've been using a shotgun mic. My voice would have been the dominant sound in the scene, but you would have also picked up a little bit of ambient noise as well, which is pretty important if you're shooting in a situation where you want some ambient noise. So Again, I think just kind of figure out what your end goal is, what your subjects are going to be that you're shooting video of, and then your mic selection will kind of go appropriately based on those things. And I think Justin said that you guys carry road products or you can get road products in. Yeah, we're a road <clears throat> dealer. So, uh, you know, that was one of the reasons why we brought them in. They're just a really popular item. Um, we've got plenty of the road goes, uh, in stock right now, the one that Jamie's using for his setup. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, if there's anything that you want to order special order, like the, the, the road link system, like, and that's like, a, um, I've got the box here somewhere, but it, it's, it's an actual kit. I think it's like six ninety nine or five ninety nine, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it has the, the receiver, the sender, and then the, uh, uh, the lavalier. So, yeah. um, yeah, but we carry those products. Yeah, for sure. I think a good start, definitely um, start off with a shotgun mic. It's going to be the most affordable entry probably for the most part. And I think a little more multi-purpose than the lav. <clears throat> um, but I think you'll find at some point you're probably going to end up getting a lavalier mic too. There are a lot of options out there. I mean, what Justin's talking about while it's on the higher end of the, the price range there, I mean, it is a wireless solution. So, you know, you could be narrating a scene from far away from your camera you know, while recording or it's perfect for interviews, but you know, it's wireless, it's more expensive. I'm sure there are other options you can look at as well. I'm always willing to, to talk to you guys. If you got more questions about those things that I've used in the past, some different options. Uh, Sandy dropped in and said, hello. And Mr. Mike Amico. Hey, how you doing, yep. Mike? Good to see it's you there. Good to see Mike. Yeah. He's down in Florida practicing his social distancing. Lucky right. bum. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hopefully he timed it out after all the spring breakers left. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I know he's got access to a pool, which is better than, than some of us here in West Michigan. For sure. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, it's not exactly swimming weather here yet. So <laughs> avoiding that at all costs. Not unless you're really brave. Right. Well, I see those surfers yeah. out there on the, on the surf cams and stuff. Those, those people are just crazy. So. You know, and I bought a cold weather wetsuit so I could do stuff like that, but I'm just, I'm too intimidated to go. So, <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's a bit intense. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. So we got Jim. Uh, Jim's asking any suggestions on where to get uh, good nature and wildlife shots without traveling a great distance? Uh, any, um, any no eagle or sandhill crane nests in the area uh, trying to comply with regulations? Oh yeah, for sure. Is if you're assuming you're on the west side of the state, somewhere in between, we'll say Holland and Muskegon in that area. Um, so there is the Ottawa Sands Park, which is uh, well, where is that at? Um, Grand Grand Haven. Yeah, it's just it's just north of Grand Haven. I'm trying to remember the the little area up there, but there is an eagle's nest there, and I'm assuming that they're reusing that nest. I haven't heard from anybody, but it was a popular spot, easy to get to. That's the Ferrysburg side, right? Ferrysburg, um, yes. That's what yep. I was thinking of. Yep. yep. So if you take the Ferrysburg exit um, and take an immediate left um, and just keep on going straight, Ottawa Sands is on the left um, mm -hmm. about a mile or, or or so before the beach. Yep. yep. Just uh, just check out, just watch for ticks. 
they're out already. I've been seeing people posting that they've been walking in the woods and coming out with ticks. And I know last year when I was at Ottawa Sands, every single time I went, I found a tick on me at some point. So, you know, tis the season. <laughs> but that's a good spot for eagles without a doubt. Uh, and that's probably probably the easiest one I can think of on that side of the state to go visit. I know that there are a lot of sightings in Spring Lake around that uh, area. Um, you could probably jump on the Facebook page for the camera shop here and maybe ask a question there. Um, Jason Helmer saying the North Shore Drive, North Shore Drive and the nest is still active. Okay, so there's another spot. Uh, maybe Jason can chime in and give where exactly along North Shore Drive it is, like rough estimate. I know we don't want to send a crowd there, but I don't think that that'll happen anyways. Um, but I think that the... And Sandy says Ottawa Sands has been very crowded lately. Uh, so we're saying live feed is interrupted. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, I can't monitor to see. It looks like everything's working on this side. <laughs> oh, hopefully it's still streaming somewhere. Streaming near a place near you, maybe. Right. Maybe I should have um, hit the record button. I didn't record this. That's so. okay. Uh, I know like when I look at you on my previous screen, you're a little slow. When I watch you on the live feed um, on my phone, it looks pretty good. So um, Shelly um, says all good. Thank you, Shelly. That's reassuring. <laughs> and Sandy says still have the feed too. Tina might've jumped in. After. Mike says looks good. Mike right. Hedge says feed is fine. All right. Good. Um, We're rocking and rolling. <laughs> I know, I know that some people, um, along like the Grand River, there've been a lot of eagles. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the a Memorial Park just off of Airline Road in Muskegon where the uh, Apache helicopter is. Okay. Um, I know that sometimes you can see them over there. There's not a there's a nest across Mona Lake, um, but I know that you can see them in the trees there sometimes. Um, yeah, a lot of it. In all honesty, the way the best success I've had with finding bald eagles to photograph down in my area in Mid Michigan. Country Drive, Country Drive out of, you know, off of the main roads, just looking out into the fields. Uh, deer are opportunistic eaters, so they will land on a carcass just as quick as they'll pull a fish out of the river. Actually, probably quicker to land on a fresh carcass. So just keep your eyes out in the fields and it helps to have a spotter. Um, maybe bring a pair of binoculars if you have a pair of binoculars. But if you have a spouse or partner, friend that you are, are, hunkered down and bunkered down with, you could throw them in the car with you to be the spotter or the driver. That's what I would recommend currently. Sandhill cranes, um, they're starting to come back quite thick down in my area. Um, I don't really have a recommendation for a location up your way, down my, my way. I could certainly recommend some areas. Um, but again, I think I have a feeling you're up that way. And Jason mentions Snug Harbor uh, in Muskegon has a uh, nest too. That one's been there for a long time. Okay. So good. Very good. Um, as far as that goes, um, again, if anybody is down in my neck of the woods, just let me know and I can point you in the right direction down here. I have a feeling because this is the Muskegon camera shops page, it's probably a lot of West coasters. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause you're, I forget. I, I always think that you're out this way, but you're really even further East of Lansing. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a lowlander down here. <laughs> <laughs> lowlander. Yeah. Uh, so I did bring some images to share. If we feel like going through kind of any kind of an image share, just to talk about different genres of photography and uh, tips and tricks and things like that for photographing some of these things. Uh, I don't know if that'll spur questions and comments if I start sharing images or not. Or if you guys have, you know, hardware questions too, I'd love to talk hardware if you want as well. And uh, I mean, I would like to ask Jamie, I know that, um, I know that you're a big Olympus shooter, but, uh, have, have you divested your, um, your repertoire as far as what you're using for your, your camera gear as of late? Yes, definitely. So, uh, for those who aren't familiar with me and what I do, I've been a brand ambassador with Olympus for, this will be my eighth year shooting with Olympus, uh, in a few different roles and categories. Uh, I started off in the visionary program transitioned over to an, an offshoot of that that they call trailblazers. I did that for a minute, jumped back into a visionary role. And then as of last year, transitioned into another role as an educator. And while shooting as a visionary and a trailblazer, part of the criteria was that 
you only shot with Olympus equipment, um, which was not a problem because that's what I started off with from day one in photography. So nothing changed for me there. But all along as technology has progressed and advanced, uh, especially in the world of mirrorless, uh, seeing all these things changing and happening and was never really able to shoot with anything else. And then when the opportunity came up to be in the educators program, uh, one of the cool changes in my contract with them was that I didn't have to shoot solely with Olympus equipment. Uh, just during my workshops that I teach, uh, will I shoot with Olympus, but on my own, I can shoot other things. So I have jumped into the Sony camp because they seem to be the other mirrorless in my world. And in my opinion, in my views, I think that the, the two to beat in the world of mirrorless are Olympus and Sony currently. I mean, Olympus feature set, weather sealing, uh, completeness of the system, you really can't beat it. And then you throw into the fact that it's micro four thirds and it's got a smaller sensor, which means your form factor can be a lot smaller. So now portability becomes paramount with the Olympus system as well. So strong points for Olympus there. Um, Sony being full frame, uh, they've kind of just taken off and dominated the mirrorless market over the past year or so, it seems like. And my, my draw to them, I think, was first having never owned a camera with a full frame sensor, just because I wanted to see what all the hype about full frame was. I mean, I was born and bred on this little half sensor size and was doing just great with it. No issues, no problems. Um, but you would always hear the other side, the, the guy on the other side of the fence saying, well, you can't do this with that little sensor and you can't do that. So <laughs> I figure, okay, I, I, I just have to at least see hands-on first, you know, real world experience to see if there is a difference. So that's why I jumped to Sony and the fact that Sony actually manufacture sensors for a lot of companies. So they kind of have their sensor technology down pat. Um, so that's what I jumped into with a Sony a seven three and, uh, not like a big collection of lenses for that camera yet. I mean, it was, um, a lot different than shooting with Olympus. Olympus provided me with the equipment. So I spent years very, very fortunate enough to not have to spend money on equipment. It was provided. So it was a huge blessing to be able to do that. So now that I'm spending my own cash, uh, I was a little more frugal with lens selection when it came to Sony. So I started off with, uh, I got the Sony body, the a seven three and a Sam Yang 14 millimeter F 2.8. Uh, it's an autofocus version and it's pretty affordable. I think I paid like $400 for that lens and 14 millimeter on full frames, pretty wide, you know? So I wanted something that was wide angle. Yeah, that's, that is pretty wide. That's, uh, actually crazy wide again coming from the uh the olympus camp and the four thirds you know aspect ratio that they've got on their sensor uh switching to was it three two on sony and, and yeah. everybody else yep. so yeah, three, two. so olympus you have a taller image a little more squarish whereas on the the sony and the other brands it's a little more rectangular a little bit shorter wider so 14 mm -hmm. millimeter just seems absurdly wide oh it is i mean you're i know you're used to shooting with the 7 to 14 for your night stuff and mm -hmm. that's something that when i i like the night sky so when i go out and shoot i you know i've used both my my sony's to do that and i've used olympus to do that mm -hmm. um but i found that uh seven on like so 14 millimeter equivalent mm -hmm. it's just too wide too wide for me so i like like the 20 millimeters my my sweet spot when i do stuff like that sure um yeah, it's. Um, uh, I'll go ahead. Oh, uh, and I I'll let you finish that thought. I we got a question here. It looks like so. Yep. Uh, no, I agree with you completely. Uh, seven millimeter. I don't find it for my work too wide, as long as I've got something that's uh, critical to the image in the foreground as well. Um, but if I'm shooting a landscape at seven millimeter on the Olympus, fourteen millimeter on the on the Sony, if if the critical point of my of my scene is far enough away. It becomes almost useless in the scene. It becomes so small at such a wide angle, but yeah, you're right. So Michael McLean has asked, uh, so what have I been able to do with the Sony that I couldn't do with the Olympus? Really nothing. I'll be honest. There's, there's really nothing I couldn't do with the Olympus that I can do with the Sony. I can, I can push ISOs higher. I mean, that's just going to be 
obvious right out of the gate, you know, given the sensor yeah. size and uh, the sensor technology on the Sony. It's a backside illuminated sensor. I think that helps with it being a little uh, more effective in low light. So I'm definitely more comfortable cranking the ISO up. Uh, I could do that with Olympus and just work in post to, to clean any kind of noise that I do have up out and still get great results. Um, that's really about it. I have a little more, little more freedom with dynamic range uh, with the full frame sensor. Again, something I can do with Olympus if I bracket shots. Um, so there's really nothing I can't do. It's just uh, it, you have like a, a little bit of a, an edge with the full frame sensor for some things that you don't for others. I guess cropping, right? I could crop in further, but uh, I've kind of always been the kind of person that if I'm cropping an image, it's just because I'm straightening something out or maybe changing the, the perspective a little bit, but I'm not ever really cropping in like in the case of wildlife or something. So I don't even see the benefit of that with the Sony for how I shoot. And I think a, a, a good point with that too is um, if you're aiming to get your frame right when you're shooting, when you're capturing it, you don't have to do as much work in the post-production, I think is. Right. Like I, I think the people that do crop on full frame, at least wildlife shooters, it's just out of necessity. I mean, you can only get so close to some of your subjects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you're, shooting with a 600 millimeter lens or something, you still might be so far away from your subject. And then having the full frame sensor does allow you to crop in and still get a nice big usable image out of it. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, if you can, if you can get the composition down, get everything framed up the way you want it in camera, then there's really no need to crop. Yeah, and, and I would make the argument too, I, you know, cause you were, you know, the question was, do you see any benefit using the Sony over the Olympus? No. And I think one of the, you know, out of all the good points that you made, it's, it's kind of like really knowing how to utilize your tool, you know, like cameras, a camera is a camera is a camera. And it's just utilizing like each camera has its strengths and has its weaknesses or each system, I should say. Um, but a good photographer, um, if, as long as you know, like your exposure triangle and what you're going out to aim for, um, you can create similar images um you know from system to system and no one would be able to tell you off of a print or anything like that right there are there are some exceptions well you of know? course there's always so, exceptions right like like live composite <laughs> yeah yeah like you know? those things like li live nd i think you know i think live nd is like a game changer um the new starry sky focus i think is a really cool thing so there are some features sure that you know some tools kind of are a set, little bit a little bar. bit sharper than other tools for certain things, but oh, yeah. you're right. At the end of the day, that's what I tell people is that a camera is a tool. Sometimes you just need a different tool for the job than you did before. And, you know, you, like you said, you can, you can use any camera to do almost anything. Just some might win out a little bit better at some things than others. Um, Mike Henge, uh, has a, has a question here. He says one, um, one thing that time at home has given, um, him has uh, allowed him a, to go through his catalog of images over 10 years uh, to see how he's evolved as a photographer um, in post-processing. Um, he's had a lot of fun with post-processing, looking at some of his older images and seeing how processor, uh, process, processing software has evolved. Mm -hmm. and, and he has also had some time to play around with the demo of Capture One. Um, and it's a good time to, to, to do that. Um, and he's wondering if anyone else is doing that same thing and maybe even kind of bring it up has has anyone else seen uh the evolution and benefit of the upgrades in the processing software well it's funny that mike brings that up because uh we have a mutual friend jerry james that lives over there in muskegon i was talking with him last night actually about capture one and he's kind of interested in checking that out as well and i've actually fielded the same question from a few different people uh do I recommend this? Do I recommend that as far as software is concerned? And it is the perfect time. If you're hunkered down inside, go download the demos of all of these pieces of software. And, <laughs> and why not? And just take, take an old set of images that you haven't looked at in a long time, see them with a fresh set of eyes and a completely new piece of software, and just run your image through each of the different pieces of software. See which workflow you like the best, which tools and interfaces were the easiest to use, and what the final results look like. And then at the end of the day, 
you know, maybe you're switching up your software game a little bit and getting away from, you know, the Adobe suite and moving into something like Capture One or On One or Luminar. There are a lot of options and they're all, it's hard to buy bad software right now. It really is. I think that what it comes down to is interface and how willing you are to, to go through the growing pains of learning a new interface and a new workflow. Um, Michael McLean asked, uh, so what about shooting at different aspect ratios on the Olympus? I think that kind of goes back to what you were bringing up with the three, two aspect ratio versus mm -hmm. the default four thirds. Right. Um, maybe just kind of, uh, touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Just kind of expand on that a little bit. Sure. So there's, I used to do that and actually still do on occasion with my Olympus cameras, change the aspect ratio. Most of the time, what I'll end up doing is dropping it down into a 16 by nine, just to kind of give some of the images that I'm making a cinematic feel right out of the camera. Uh, there's no reason you can't do it. There's no reason not to do it. You do sacrifice a little bit of your sensor when you're cropping, because that's basically what you're doing is you're cropping to that aspect ratio. So you're not utilizing the full sensor in creating your image. No wrong way of doing it. No right way of doing it. It's just how you want your end result to look. And I say experiment with that. Uh, one of the things that I love to do with the aspect ratios in the Olympus cameras is if you throw on the nine millimeter fisheye body cap lens or the eight millimeter fisheye or another manufacturer's fisheye, put that lens on and then set your aspect ratio to 16 by nine. And what happens is the curvature of a fisheye at the top and bottom that gets cut out. You still have the curvature on the ends you tend to not notice it quite as much, especially if you're working well to keep your horizon centered. But what you end up with is an ultra, ultra wide angle lens. Uh, great for cool landscape shots. That's it's something actually I should probably do that soon. I haven't done that in a while, but it's something that I used to love doing with the fisheye lenses. Yeah, that actually sounds uh, that actually sounds pretty cool because um, that body cap is only like 45 bucks, right? It's dirt cheap. Dirt yeah, cheap. And and so it's like essentially it's a pinhole and you're you're almost doing like um not like a panel print you know right. to some extent yeah yes, for sure uh, in in camera um and if i could add to the ratio game i know that uh when i was in school at least one of my instructors uh, we had to use Hasselblad cameras and if everyone is familiar or not familiar with Hasselblads is that they're a 120 millimeter format which means they're a square format so it's one to one mm -hmm. And uh, I know that she said that uh, that shooting or framing with um, a square is a little bit more difficult than what you would normally get with a rectangle. She's like figuring out a composition with a square is just a little mm -hmm. bit trickier. Um, so if you can kind of master that, um, you know, that's it's kind of a nice thing. So it's it's almost like a challenge. I would I would you know like what you were saying try to experiment. I think that um, if you go out and set your ratios, I know Olympus has just a little bit more, has mm -hmm. what, four options versus two mm -hmm. uh, or, or five. So it's it's one of those things where if you have an Olympus, go experiment and you can see your frame right there and, yep. uh, you know, go and like do give yourself a, a, a whole week test on one to one or a whole week run through on four or five. Um, and just see what your results are. See how you're looking at the frame and the scene differently. I don't know how many of you are uh, old enough to remember when Instagram was just a one-to-one -one aspect ratio for your pictures. That's what I used to do back then with my Olympus cameras. I'd shoot RAW plus JPEG, and I would set it at one-to-one. -one. My JPEGs came out square. I had a full-framed, you know, full-sensor RAW file. But the square ones, I would just Wi-Fi over from my Olympus camera to my smartphone, and those ones would go straight up on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, you know, now now anything goes on Instagram. It doesn't have to be square. It's not hip to be square on Instagram anymore. But they are only, they're not doing 2-3. You can do 2-3. You need another program, but I think default's 4-3 out of yeah. that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's something right there, but, uh, Jim is asking, um, there's been a lot of discussion regarding shooting raw versus JPEG, uh, any suggestions for good post-processing, uh, post-processing programs that are free. He's currently using a blend of Picasa and view NX2, which is from Nikon. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not ready to take the jump into a monthly premium at this time. So, um, I'm not too familiar, Jamie, with any free stuff outside of like 30 day trials. Um, right. What, uh, what, what do you? 
what do you I, have to suggest? So in all honesty, if it's going to be something that's free, I'm probably going to just do it on mobile and I'll use Snapseed. Snapseed yeah, is an yep. incredible piece of software for editing your photos. And at some point you're probably going to want to either invest in a standalone piece of software or a subscription. I know the subscription model is kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, I resisted it for as long as I could and then, you know, bit the Adobe pill. But as we were speaking about earlier, now's the time to just go download all those demos and just start playing with them. You've got most of the demos are at least two weeks. You know, some of them are up to 30 days and really dig into them and figure out which one you like. And then, you know, when the time comes and you're ready to spend the money, you'll know which one to invest in. Uh, as far as the standalones that I have personal experience with, it's going to be the Luminar and Aurora HDR from Skylum. Those are both great. Uh, the latest Luminar is super cool. It does all kinds of cool stuff with sky replacement and the AI functionalities built in are great. I mean, anybody can throw an image into the Luminar suite and get something cool right out of the gate. So those are good. Uh, the on one is the suite. I'm using that as well. This was after trials for both of those. I did the trials, liked them enough to where I just plunked down the money and bought them. Uh, on one is great because it comes with a whole suite of things for just your raw editor. You can get a, a great landscape, wildlife, whatever image out of that. But it also, they have portrait tools as well that are great and make it easy for anyone to get good portrait results. Uh, prices vary between the two. I know that the, the Luminar software is, I think, on sale right now for probably like 70 bucks or 80 bucks. Uh, and they give frequent updates and regular updates and you buy it once and you own it forever. So those are the two that I'd recommend to pay for free stuff. It's really just going to be mobile apps because I don't know of anything free other than the GIMP, which is basically a Photoshop clone an open source Photoshop clone. Uh, but that's again, going to be a little more advanced like Photoshop is and not quite as intuitive as some of these other ones from Skylum and on one. Is uh, is Luminar the one that is pretty like modular in the respects like you can set up everything like the way mm -hmm. you want it as far as like your your layout on for processing? Uh, Luminar, I know that you can. So your your side panel that's on you know your work work screen or whatever, you can add modules to that. You know, so a module for your tone curves and for hue saturation and luminance and for sky adjustments and things like that. So it's modular in that regards, but uh, that's my extent with that. I haven't seen if there's any more modularity other than just adding or removing your frequently used tools from the sidebar. Okay. Yeah. Cause I knew I, you know, I liked uh, the photographer is one of my favorite, you know, uh, reads uh, for, for photo stuff. And I know that they um, there's one of them out there that, was uh, pretty nice as far as you can set up the you can set up your workspace the way you want you're not kind of like I think, mitigated i think it's capture one that's like capture that. one yeah and okay. i don't have any experience with that personally but it seems to get a lot of good reviews uh, michael um, mcclean said that in that um, affinity is 50 percent off and i do have affinity for my ipad pro i have not used the desktop version but i've been extremely impressed with their software on mobile so if their desktop software is anything like that, it's probably a good buy. Uh, 20, Russ was twenty five bucks. Man, twenty five is not bad. Uh, Dark uh, Russ is saying that Dark Table's on PC, and that comes to mind. And he says that's uh, free open source. And Dark uh, Table is a Lightroom alternative, if I'm not mistaken. So there you go. If you went with Dark Table and the GIMP, you would basically have Lightroom and Photoshop, both open source, both free. Is that G I M P? Or GYMP. GIMP. Yep. Okay. It's a strange name for a piece of software. Yeah, well, <laughs> well you got to wonder what acronyms, man. Acronyms are just right. uh, interesting things. Yeah, their logo is not a gentleman with a black mask with a zipper over the mouth. <laughs> for those who are Pulp Fiction fans out there, you'll get the reference. Uh, 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 so yeah, guys, anyone who's tuning in, just as a reminder, uh, this is an open Q&A, so don't be shy if you guys have any questions while you're tuning in. Uh, that's what uh, Jamie and I are here for, especially Jamie. Um, if you have any questions on his workflow, uh, his shooting style, uh, genres, anything. you name it. Yeah. Yep. It's an ask me anything. Sky's the limit. Favorite bourbon, favorite place I've ever visited, favorite <laughs> color. 
I, don't I didn't know we were, I didn't know we were going that far, but oh, it's keep oh. the conversation going. We got to be entertaining. Yeah. Uh, so I don't see any more questions coming in quite yet. I just want to make sure, rolling back, that I didn't miss anything from anyone. Um, yeah, I don't think so. I think a great stuff out there about being creative at home this is from Jason Klein. What are my tips for being creative at home? Okay, yep, there's that one. Uh, I, so sit down with your camera, pick out a lens, and run through the aperture range. Set something up on the table. Get familiar with all the basics. Start back from square one. Get familiar with how far you can push your aperture, how far you can stop it down before you start getting diffraction and things start to fall apart. Note the sweet spot. Start doing comparisons from one lens to the next just to uh, get familiar with the different looks that you get from different lenses. It's funny. I don't think people realize how much different the same focal length can look from one lens to another. So for example, I've got four or five lenses that will all give me the ability to shoot at 50 millimeters. They all have a very different look and the different look is going to be based on the lens elements that go into that lens, whether it was one of the higher end lenses, one of the middle of the road, one of the cheaper. I've got vintage lenses that I've adapted to put on my cameras and those all give completely different looks. Uh, the optics, the coatings on the optics will also influence how the look of your images turns out. Um, so getting really intimate and familiar with, with how each one of your lenses performs on your different camera bodies, that's something that I like to do. Um, I did a shootout, it's been a couple of years, but I put all of the Olympus primes on the same camera and the same tripod shape, shot the same subject from varying focal lengths, just to see what the field of view looked like on all those kind of get myself familiar with out having to put the lens on being able to look out in front of me and knowing, okay, if I put the 17 millimeter on, this is going to be in the frame. If I put the 25 on, I know I've got that much less in my frame. So exercises like that, that just get you really, comfortable and familiar with what your equipment offers is, is a fun thing to do. And you can just do that sitting out in your yard. It's a gorgeous day for it right now. The sun is out and just sit out in your yard, bring all your lenses and your gear out and just start focusing on the same spot and just switch lens, switch lens, switch lens, get familiar with what you're going to see in your frame. Go back through, imagine in your head, this is what's going to be in the frame. Now throw the lens on that you think fits that. Um, and the reason I keep talking about doing this thing, getting familiar with it is because for me, as someone who shoots landscapes and wildlife primarily, uh, I don't, I don't go into a situation not knowing probably what equipment I'm going to need. So a uh, popular theme in my photography is this barn that I photograph. I know where I need to be along the road that that barn sits on for any given lens. And I know that depending on the situation, whether it's going to be a sunset or a storm is rolling in or what have you. I know exactly what gear I'm going to pack because I know where I'm going to be sitting because I'm familiar with my field of view. And then it also helps in genres that I am not familiar with. Uh, great example is I took a trip to Chicago last summer with a friend and we were walking around through the city and I didn't even have to hold my camera up. I could just hold it right here at my chest. I could hold it down low at my hip. And because I knew exactly what would fit in my frame with the 17 millimeter on my Olympus Pen F, I could go through and just candid street shoot and not worry about what was going to be in the frame because I've shot enough with that lens to know from any given distance, this is approximately what's going to be in my frame. So familiarity, it's uh, just going through the same motions over and over again and just kind of getting it ingrained in you. Yeah. It's, it's creating that muscle memory. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other thing is too, like different lenses have different looks and you're talking like the focal lengths, there's barrel distortion, you know, mm -hmm. and like what you see at 35 is a lot different than what you see at 85. Um, one of my favorites, uh, you're talking about kind of shooting with like through your, your repertoire of lenses. One of my favorite studies from school that I can remember that I've been wanting to do as like, uh, uh, as a, like a photo challenge on Facebook that I've been doing is light over time. Mm -hmm. and s setting up your tripod in one spot with a still life that you set up, or maybe it's a flower in your garden or, you know, something that's just isn't moving that you can just keep the camera on and set up and then just shoot it, you know, like every hour on the hour through the day and just see uh, at what time the light is doing what, you know, mm -hmm. and, and what the, the color of that light is, the quality of that light. Um, and that will help you, um, 
that will help you with your your whole quality of light and time of day kind of stuff. That's that's always a good one too at home. That's a great exercise actually. And I think today, again, perfect opportunity for something like that because we are starting off with bright, warm sunlight right now. And as the day moves on, you're going to see your shadows move. You're going to see the color temperature change. Just the look and feel and tone of your images will change throughout the day. That's probably something I'll go try. I like that one. Yeah. No, that's, it's, it's one of my favorites. And, uh, I just remember my instructor saved, like she used my, um, uh, my setup as, as the example for the class. And I was anal retentive about it. I think I shot every 15 minutes, which was absurd. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, it was just really cool. I set it up. Um, I set it up in, uh, in the back room. I lived in Minnesota at the time. It's kind of like a sunroom almost. Um, and I took two wine glasses and a wine bottle and I put wine in a glass and I purposely spilled it on the table and I just shot through the whole day just to, to see how all that, how that changed. And, um, it's just really cool. It's just, uh, and there's so many things like that, that you can do at home that are just really simple. Uh, self portraits are always a That's good fun. one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I know that I've got a friend on Instagram who, who's, who's like, well, every day, through this, uh, ch uh, through our corner social distancing quarantine kind of thing. He's like, until it's lifted, I'm doing a self portrait every day. And I challenge my photo friends to do the same. And that's kind of difficult to, to challenge yourself to do a different self portrait every single day. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's more than a two week challenge. You know, it could be a 30 day challenge. It could turn into a 60 day challenge. <laughs> I, I hope to God it doesn't turn into no. a 60 day challenge. Um, we, uh, nobody will have jobs after that. So, um, but yeah, I just, I just, um, one of the books that I have, um, oh man, I, I have it in the car. I almost want to like pull everything off and go get it. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a book that just is a book of assignments for photographers. Mm. Um, that's uh that's like a bunch of instructors from around the world of giving you just different photo challenges um i, I guess another one um before we go to mike hedges uh, question here is uh do a photo journal um mm. one of my instructors told me that uh um what's really important is to like limit limit your sh maybe go out and kind of purposely limit yourself in shooting like uh, like a roll of film like 24 shots or 36 shots and um while you're walking and, and doing these images, you know, write down your ISO, write down your aperture, your shutter speed, um, what time of day it was, what, what was the quality of light? What was the direction of the sunlight? And you're just kind of sketching that, sketching your scene, writing down your information, and then um, later on printing a photo and putting it in there to correspond with what you, what you did. So if you came along a park bench and you saw someone sitting down, you're like, oh, I want to catch this as a silhouette you know, you, you were able to do that. And then it's kind of like having muscle memory to come back to because you wrote it down. You're like, oh, this is a silhouette. It's a similar situation, similar summit time of day. What were my, what were my settings for that? So yeah. very good exercise. So Mike Hedge is asking about uh, what kind of process do I use to schedule or manage posts to my social media across all the platforms? Seems like Facebook has made it difficult to schedule posts unless you have a business page and scheduling software. Uh, I know it's tough. Uh, I get the inconsistency part. Trust me. I totally understand. Uh, but so for me personally, I do have a Facebook business page for my photography. There's really no way around it. Um, I know it's kind of a bummer to try to direct people to somewhere else if you don't already have one set up, but you'll probably want to set one up anyways, just because of the benefits you'll get from it, like being able to schedule posts out in advance. Um, I use Hootsuite is what I use to get stuff fired out to multiple platforms at one time. Uh, there is a free version of Hootsuite. You just have to scroll all the way to the bottom of their page to find how to get it for free. And it's a little limited if you have it free. It just gives you access to a couple of accounts that you can schedule things to. But for the average person, that's more than enough to be able to schedule out to say, you know, your Facebook and your Instagram or your Facebook and Twitter, something like that. Uh, so Hootsuite is what I use. I also use a software program called If This Then That. You can get the app for your phone. And If This Then That basically just runs a series of events. And these, these events, they call them recipes. And if you get If This Then That, 
and start searching for Instagram recipes, or I can share my recipe with people here if they want it. My if this, then that routine is set up so that if I make a post on Instagram, if this, then that watches my Instagram feed, I make a new post, it takes that post, it takes the image from that post and natively embeds it in a tweet and then shares a tweet of that image as well. So you can shoot out stuff from Instagram to Twitter, I think within the Instagram app, but basically it just links back to your Instagram, <clears throat> links back to your Instagram post and you basically just have a thumbnail of what the image looks like in the tweet. Whereas with if this, then that, you get the native full size image in the tweet and the link back to Instagram. So Hootsuite shoots it out to Twitter and to Facebook for me. Instagram, I do everything right within the app. And it's there's no easiness to it. You're either going to sit down and pre-schedule out stuff to go out throughout the week, which takes time, or you're probably going to spend the same amount of time and just break it up throughout the course of the week uh, and do individual posts. It's not quite as easy because it's more disruptive to your day to do it that way. <clears throat> but um, Hootsuite is probably the easiest free one to use, and I totally recommend those guys all day long. Um, and I just wanted to kind of re-highlight it. I think we have some more people uh, tuning in. Uh, this is an, a live Q&A um, with Jamie McDonald. So if you guys have any questions, uh, don't be shy. Uh, ask anything you want. Uh, Jamie even suggested um, uh, his favorite type of what uh, whiskey or something like that or, or, <laughs> or what you're what you're drinking tonight um, right. <laughs> so I just I just want to throw that out there for everyone but Michael Breen has a good question in the meantime um, what is a good site to build a website um, or a place to sell your photos so I know again my genre is different than probably most people that sell pictures for a living you know those being portrait wedding event those type of people. Uh, I know that people that do the portrait type work, a lot of them like Zenfolio and Smug Mug are two really popular choices. Uh, for just the average person, I think to build a website easily and still retain the ability to sell. Um, I like Squarespace. I've been using Squarespace for about five years now. Uh, it's literally a drag and drop interface. You just drag things to where you want them on your page. And they also give you the, the ability to have like a storefront or e-com section to your site. And I use that to sell uh, canvases and prints and then also some of my presets as well. I've had a lot of success with Squarespace. So I, I recommend them highly just because it's easy. I know that one I'm using right now, um, Shootproof is kind of a, is another popular one. They've really kind of streamlined that for photographers. Um, it's, you can set up, um, you know, your, your store with, uh, like uh, multiple printers. If, if you mm -hmm. want, uh, you can even source like a local printer. Nice. Um, so like if you wanted to use the camera shop as your local printer, um, you would just, you know, select the prices that you want, put in the prices that you have to pay and it. And then basically everything happens behind the scenes. You would still have to order the prints from us. Um, but, and then you could deliver them. And then there's other ones that are all kind of uh, all incorporated, like white house, custom color, um, Bay photo, some other big names like that. And when you set your prices and basically something sells, it gets sent to them and they, they can take care of everything for you as far as production and shipping. And basically you just had to build the site and create the connection. Um, so I know about, about that one. Nice. Um, but you're you're really making me want to go to Squarespace, Squarespace because I've got Live Books and mm. Live Books still hasn't integrated uh, any kind of like uh, purchase kind of thing. It's 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 kind of a nice setup, but uh, you know here I am thinking I'm just kind of like you know throwing money away when I could be uh, setting something up where you know having presets and and things like that are are kind of a nice attribute to be able to sell outside of your your photo stuff. So. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Easy again, easy to to set up, and uh, I don't think I've ever had an issue with them where there were maintenance issues or anything like that. No security issues. Uh, I think also, if you don't have a domain name yet registered somewhere, I think if you get your hosting through them, you know your website. I think they give you your domain name for free, so that's always a bonus too to not have to worry about that and have everything housed in one place. Currently, all my domains rest under GoDaddy, and then my site is through. Through Squarespace. I wish I could just 
I, I can, I should move everything over to, to GoDaddy and just have it all housed in one spot. I just haven't gotten around to it. I suppose I have time now. Yeah. Uh, don't make the mistake I made and like accidentally purchase one through Google and the rest of them sit at GoDaddy, like ones that I might want to use or something like that. And now I got to figure out how to get out of Google's hands and get it into GoDaddy's hands or, or vice right. versa. So Mike so, is asking if Squarespace helps move pages from an existing website. That's a good question. I built mine from scratch just because of how quick and easy it was. Uh, they have templates and it was pretty much my old website. I copied and pasted just text and put things in. Um, I'm sure that you could probably export your site out as HTML and uh, import that in and just do blank pages and paste in the code. I'm guessing that should work. Theoretically, it should work just fine. I'll tell you what though, their support staff is incredibly good. 24 hours a day, someone is there to answer your questions fast. And if anybody can answer that, it's going to be those guys. So just hit up their support team. And Shannon was asking, uh, what were the sites that handle the shipping um, or whatnot for you again? Um, really what it is, Shannon, like if you chose uh, Shootproof as your um, as your online retailer, like you're going to set up a little website through them. And that's kind of the nice thing is that you can set up just quick galleries. You don't have to have... Um, you don't have to own a domain name. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You could just go set up a shoot proof thing and have a shoot proof page. Um, I have mine integrated through my website, uh, which is just like copying, pasting an HTML code. Um, but shoot proof and other um, subsidiaries like them, what they do is you pay your membership annually or monthly and they have everything set up for shipping. So basically you will choose uh, one of their fulfillers, one of their printers, uh, that, you know, some have two, some have three, mm -hmm. you know, others might have five and you could, you select from that list and uh, essentially everything's taken care of for you. You just set the prices and upload your photos uh, and that's it. Nice. Yeah. And they, and they drop shit right to the, uh, to the customer, right? Correct. You can, uh, from what I've read and researched since I have one myself is uh, you can have it shipped to your stuff if you want. So if you want to do like hand delivery or if mm -hmm. you're going to set up something like, well, I want everything to come to my house so that I can repackage it in my, my like my packaging. If you had mm -hmm. like some of your own company packaging or if you're going to sell it at like a farmer's market or something. Uh, but what this allows you to do is that if you're able to broaden your base of uh, consumers, like let's say uh, cross state or maybe someone on the east side of the state. Um, uh, it's just easier to get that to them uh, that way, having it drop ship, like Jamie said. Nice, very cool. Yeah, Very cool. Uh, any more questions? Let's see, make sure we're not missing anybody here. Not missing anything, good. So where do we go from here, Justin? We've been talking for about an hour. Um, do you wanna do any kind of gear talk uh, you want to talk images you want to talk workshops what do you guys want to talk about um well I, I i mean have you ever put it to a vote to all the all the viewers out there what what they might want to do um i don't know i like to give people options and sometimes that's a weakness or a strength i don't know um i don't mind talking gear you know do we talk about the new em one mark three um you know do we I mean, what's new and exciting out there in the industry mm -hmm. that you've seen? I'll be honest with you. I feel like everything right now is kind of at this state where it is going through incremental updates. And it's been a while since we've seen anything just massively revolutionary hit the market. Uh, and I don't, I'm kind of concerned with how the whole global pandemic is going to affect, you know, product development, any sort of R and D efforts that are being made overseas probably have been put on hold or slowed down. So I think this year will probably be pretty slow on that front. Uh, I know I've been shooting with the new Olympus 12 to 45 millimeter lens. Got a lot of questions about that. Uh, a lot of people asking why I was shooting with that and not the 12 to 40, their pro lens. Mm -hmm. um, and people <laughs> asking why would I get this versus that? And but they're both pro lenses, Jamie. <laughs> right. Yeah. And there are differences, obviously, you know, one is fixed 2.8, one is fixed F4. Uh, one has a manual focus clutch. One does not. Saw my workshop ad and it looked pretty cool. Thank you, sir. Um, so the, the, the difference between the two though, uh, for me, primarily, I got the 12 to 45 because I was planning a trip still fingers crossed 
uh, hoping I can make it to Iceland in June with my kids. Uh, we haven't canceled anything yet, so I'm holding out to the very end on that trip. But I purchased that lens specifically for that trip as a way to maintain a smaller system when traveling around the country for 10 days by camper van uh, where space is limited. So uh, there are definitely perks to that. Currently, if you are shooting with an EM10 Mark III or an EM5 Mark III, one mm -hmm. of the smaller bodies and one not necessarily with a grip, and you wanted that focal range uh, in a in a really good robust lens, you are going to be putting the 12 to 40 on, which is noticeably larger than the 12 to 45. So I think that for me, the the big motivator was to get something more compact and the close focusing on that lens is astounding. It's darn near like using a, uh, a macro lens. And I, and I do have one here just by chance. Um, if people wanted to see it, I would just have to jump off camera quick. Um, uh, of course, you probably have yours pretty close at hand as well. Um, Mike and I were going to touch on that for our live broadcast that we did on Wednesday, but since mm -hmm. we filled the time with other things, we didn't get to it. Sure. Um, but I know that Shelly said that we should do an image share, but Mike also asked um, whether um, if you're mm -hmm. using the magnetic filter holders or the Nissi filters, any feedback on filters? Yeah, so... Um, so First, uh, we'll do an image share here shortly. I'll jump into those in a minute. Um, the the question about the magnetic filter holders for the Nisi filters, I've got all the magnetic frames on all of my filters from Nisi, and I also have the, uh, the new holder that they sent me as well. I haven't had an opportunity to get out and really put it through its paces yet. I have dry fit everything up to my lenses to make sure everything fits good and it's easy to use. Uh, having not even gone out to use them and just assembling it here and setting it up. I'm going to say if you're a Nisi filters user, or if you're using Haida or any of the, any of those filters, those magnetic frames are cool. They're super cool. Uh, right now, if you, if for those not familiar with what we're talking about here, I'm just kind of talking straight to Mike at this point. Uh, most of the square filter systems, if you want to put more than one filter in, what you're doing is you're sliding a filter down this holder. And if you want to add another filter, just in front of that one, there's another set of grooves that you slide another glass filter in. So you're stacking up your filters that way. They have a little bit of a gap between them because of the spacing in the slots. It's kind of cumbersome. It's not the easiest thing to do. And there's a company, uh, I can drop information probably in the chat later on who the company is, but they make these frames that lock onto your existing rectangle and square filters. And inside of those frames are magnets. So instead of having to slip your filters down into a groove, you just stack them one on top of the other magnetically. And it is super convenient to be able to do that. I can't wait to get better, uh, not quarantine weather and get over to the lake shore on the west side of the state and start using my filters again and using those that way, just because it's going to speed up the process of, uh, of adding filters to my, to my lens. And, and just out of curiosity, that is not Nissi that makes that right. That's a different company. It's a different company. They make their own yep. filters, but these yep. they also make the frames that go on the Nissi filters as well. So, so is does it start with a G or something? Because I think no, we start carrying those. It's uh, H and Y. Yeah, H and Y. So we do carry that through Pro. Pro Master okay. is yep. is servicing those. So you can order the rectangular frames from us in a holder. Nice. Um, it's I highly recommend it. Uh, get over to the store and check those out. They're super cool. I do have a test one that I ordered because um, they have uh, like ProMaster has some of their uh, HGX uh, uh, neutral density filters. So I've got uh, like four different ones mm -hmm. and a holder that people can test if they want. I set it up as kind of like a rental thing. Nice. Um, but I also see that Mike is asking about um, a 100 to 400 for a 5D SR. Oh, that's all so, you, buddy. That's not so, me. That's not the mirrorless camera. That's the SLR. So if you've got a 5D SR, there's two lenses that I would recommend. Um, we've got a 100 to 400 Sigma that is going to be $619.99 right now. Um, that's a pretty good price, I think, from what it normally is, $899. And then you have the 150 to 600, which uh, at $899 from $1089, um, that's readily in stock. I, I would have to check on the 100 to 400. Um, but between those two, um, the 100 to 400 doesn't have a tripod uh, collar. 
that's more or less designed just to be kind of like a handheld lens. Whereas the 150 to 600 has the, the collar already as a part of it. Um, so at 899, um, it's, it's, that's kind of my go-to over the 100 to 400, unless you want kind of like a walk around telephoto. I just like having the range that the 150 to 600 provides mm -hmm. at that price point. So, um, hopefully that answers your question. For sure. And answered mine. <laughs> I, I know absolutely nothing about Canon. So any chance I get to educate myself is probably good. Well, as most, and I, I'm, you know, can answer no problem for the most part. I hope so. You, uh, you work at a camera store. <laughs> that, that's always no, a good thing. That's yeah, not my day job. <laughs> <laughs> that's outside of my purview. There we go. All right, so I'll just do I'll just run through a few quick images just to kind of talk about uh, how some of them were made, uh, inspiration behind them, settings and things like that. So we talked about uh, asked earlier some of the advantages or things that I can do with my Sony that I can't do with my Olympus, and I actually feel like flipping that completely around because there are so many things that I can do with my Olympus that I just I don't feel comfortable trying to accomplish with the Sony. Um, this is not necessarily one of those, but we'll get into that here in a moment. But this is just a, I've got this thing for self portraits when I'm out shooting. What I like to try to do is shoot whatever environment event I'm in, but I like to also try to squeeze in a, a self portrait to show the environment that I was in with me in the setting. These are just not really a narcissistic thing. I swear they're just uh, something to look back on later in life and, and just have these little memories of, I remember that day I was chasing storms and it was a February, believe it or not, when this was shot, uh, a rare February thunderstorm a couple of years ago. And uh, chased this storm for probably about two hours. Actually, it was not just me chasing it. There were three other cars of us trying to catch up with the storm cell, three of us, three car loads from three different parts of the state, all chasing the storm. And probably drove 150, 200 miles trying to get in a good position to shoot this. And where this shot ended up being taken was probably about five miles from my house. So I, I drove probably 195 miles uselessly. And the last five miles of it is where I ended up getting the shot. And the way this was taken was I got ahead of the storm cell. It was coming in and it was getting pretty active, uh, frequent lightning. So I had set up to do a live composite and got one really good lightning shot that's that I won't share here. Um, but after I got that lightning shot, okay, maybe I can get myself in one of these frames as well. So I set up the camera on the tripod and set it to do a time-lapse. And I went with the longest shutter speed that I could get uh, realistically, which wasn't that long because it was still fairly light out. So I think I was at just about half a second and just set up the time-lapse and just wandered out in the field and waited until a big flash of lightning. And I just crossed my fingers and thought, hopefully I get a shot out of this because I'm not sticking around much longer because the storm is getting a lot closer when that strike there happened. And I got back to the car. Luckily for me, uh, I did get the shot. Something that I'd always wanted to do was a lightning selfie. So mission accomplished there. I've gotten a lot of heat when I share this photo. People say that it's kind of irresponsible to share an image like this. Granted, um, I'm not telling people to go do this, but it was kind of a fun experience to do. And this was shot with the OMD EM1 Mark II the 12 to 40 and i actually have another olympus camera in my hand in this shot as i was walking out there you have to have a disclaimer before that jamie like the image you are about to see we do not condone any acts of trying this yourself you know yes. kind of thing like please do not attempt this at home <laughs> right I, sh I should run the disclaimer across the bottom of the screen <laughs> yeah like the little ticker the cnn ticker All right definitely um so the next one this is uh, the theme here for the next couple of photos, obviously, is, is lightning. I'm a big fan of chasing down storms in the summer. And one of the people that uh, is or was watching in the audience was here for this shot this night. Rick Kefjen was with me and another photographer from down this way. We all chased these storms all over, all over the state until we finally got to this uh, location south of Jackson on an old country road. And while we were all set up shooting, I set my Olympus tough point and shoot on the roof of my car. And if you're not familiar with Olympus's point and shoot line, their tough cameras are amazing little rugged cameras that have a really good feature set built into them. So this was shot with a point and shoot using a feature called live composite. And again, just a quick rundown of what live composite is. It basically lets you run a long exposure 
image that won't overexpose uh, as long as your base exposure is, is set well, which this one was. So this is about a 20 minute shot right here, done with a point and shoot. Uh, on the left side of the image where the, the bulk of the lightning is at, that's where the storm originally started. And then there was a long gap between the secondary bolt, which you see on the right, which happened probably about 15 minutes later. Uh, and these are all fireflies and lightning bugs off on the periphery of the frame here. It was kind of cool to see all these lightning bugs lighting up. We weren't getting rained on at all because the storm was probably about 50 or 60 miles off to our east in the distance. And fun to be able to get a shot like this with a point and shoot camera. So don't discount what you can do with all the different equipment available out there. Uh, this next shot, I think Rick Kefjen was there for this one too. Uh, this is obviously in Grand Haven. Uh, was this last year, Rick? Maybe Rick can jump in and, and answer in the chat room. I think it was last year. We spent quite a bit of time out on the pier that evening. And this is the culmination of about another 30 minutes worth of lightning. Again, using that same live composite function on the Olympus cameras. This was shot with the OMD EM1X and I believe the 12 to 100 millimeter F4 Pro on live composite. And if you have any questions about shooting lightning or tips and tricks on how to get positioned for shooting storms, things like that, I'm watching the chat room as well. So you guys can go ahead and ask questions. And just an FYI, that TG6 is mm -hmm. only 379 right now. So that's a really uh, good price. And they pack that point shoot with a, a lot of stuff. So it's normally 449. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great price under 400 bucks for uh, that point shoot camera. And it does great macro as well. I got a lot of people who pick it up just for the macro. Yeah. The macro on that camera is insane. Uh, it's like literally almost like using a microscope. Um, so the next shot, this is shot with an actually a quite a bit older Olympus camera. This is the original OMD EM one, but I had it converted to infrared. Uh, I, I actually had a conversation with a gentleman last night talking about wanting to get into black and white photography more. He really loves the look and feel of a black and white image and just wasn't sure the best route to go about it. And I gave him some tips on shooting in black and white and how to kind of pre-visualize a scene that's going to look good in black and white and some tips to actually see it in black and white before he shoots. But I also suggested to him that if he does really fall passionately in love with black and white photography. A good investment is to find a used camera on the marketplace somewhere. somewhere and there are companies that you can get, uh, you can send your camera to to have them convert it to infrared, which is what this one was done. This is a uh, 830 nanometer conversion. Uh, so that's answering Michael's, they popped up right when I was saying it. So 830 nanometer is the conversion on this through life pixel. Uh, and this is pretty much straight out of camera. So this is actually JPEG out of the camera. I did a custom white balance in camera so that instead of getting the purpley looking image that you'll get from an infrared converted camera, it comes out in a nice monotone. Really fun to shoot uh, with an infrared converted camera. Your blue skies turn this inky black. And if there is any haze in the distance, like on a summer day when it looks hazy off in the distance, an infrared converted camera cuts through that haze. So the haze is pretty much eliminated. Uh, so Michael's asking what camera it was. That was actually an older version of the Olympus Tough. So that was the TG5. They now have the TG6 out that is uh, even better and more capable than the TG5 was. Uh, next image again. So I'm a sucker for, for stormy, inclement weather. Uh, while this wasn't a storm that brought in uh, thunder and lightning, it brought in a lot of cold and this is at point betsy uh one of my favorite places here in michigan for sure these breakwaters that that jut out into the lake make for great leading lines this is just a longer exposure this is done with the omd em1 mark ii and the 7 to 14 millimeter and i have an nd6 neutral density filter on this so that i could stretch my exposure out it's not real long exposure i think we're probably like half a second on this one and I agree, Mike, the watercolor at Point Betsy is astounding. I'm so in love with that place. Yeah, it's 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 just interesting how the color changes as you go further north uh, around the lake. I think it's kind of like um, from Frankfurt north. It's just really cool. Yes, gorgeous. We're pretty lucky to live in this state, I tell you. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this, is again, is an older shot. 
<clears throat> excuse me, good grief. Um, this was this is something that you know that anybody can do if you have an Olympus camera, it makes it easier because you're taking a single shot. But this is one of those things where during this quarantine time, it's perfect to get out and find a lonely set of tracks or lonely road or whatever and use that as part of your composition. Uh, this is a shot I've been wanting to do for or had been wanting to do for quite a while and decided one night at like 11 o'clock to just jump off the couch spur of the moment and run out the door and go try to make the shot happen. So I pre-conceptualized this by using a few different apps. Um, I used basically Google Earth to find a set of train tracks that were running due north and south so that I could get the North Star, you know, in line with the direction that the tracks were rolling in. And so once I found that, I got out the photographer's ephemeris and just double check to see what time sunset was going to be. And again, to try to get everything lined up for my shot. And I had the place picked out and hadn't done anything about it for weeks. And then, like I said, it was just kind of a spur of the moment deal. I jumped off the couch at 10 or 11 o'clock one night and raced out to try to make this. So this is just a live composite shot that feature in the Olympus cameras that lets me do the lightning photos so easily. Also lets me do star trails in camera. And this was taken with the 12 to 40 millimeter. And I think on the EM5 Mark II, again, a little bit of an older camera, but an easy shot to pull off using using that in-camera feature. And just be mindful, was the, the moon wasn't shining in that photo, right, Jamie? There was nope. no moon. There was actually a uh like a so this was a rural railroad crossing, rural railroad crossing. That's an easy one to say. Uh that had a street light above it in the middle of nowhere. And the street light actually cast a very yellow orangey look to it. So I ended up white balancing to get that color cast fixed. And in the process of doing that white balance, the sky ended up turning this really, really deep violet. And I kind of liked the way it looked. So I just left it that way and didn't try to alter the sky back to its natural black and super dark blue. Yeah, because that's that's something to be mindful of is be mindful of your lunar um your lunar mm. schedule and like when the moon is gonna be up and out because that'll either add or take away from your your star trail when you're shooting. Uh definitely will. Um it, it's mostly gonna be a consideration, I think, if you're after Milky Way, because it'll something where you need to uh be able to crank up the ISO and, and shoot wide open. The Milky Way becomes really faint the more moon you have in the sky. I don't run into too many troubles with it affecting live composite shots. Uh, what you have to worry about is your foreground being lit up so much by a full moon that it looks like daytime. I probably should have brought an image that I have taken over, uh, over near your guys' direction of a barn that's got a star trail over it but it almost looks like it was done during the day because the full moon lit the entire barn up so well. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a, a shot in Chicago and this is me going back to talking about understanding what your focal length is going to look like without having to pull the camera up to your eye. This was a spur of the moment shot walking across the street, uh, a big puddle in the road from a, a rainstorm the previous night without hardly even stopping for more than a millisecond. I just set my camera down really low to my side and just popped off two shots. I popped off the first shot. I was pretty much level. And then the second shot, I tilted the camera up just a little bit more and dropped the camera closer to the water. Didn't even look at the, uh, at the camera until I got back to my hotel room and realized I think I took one of my favorite photos I've ever shot in Chicago. But again, knowing what my focal length was going to look like on my camera, I had an idea of how much I could fit in the frame when I did this shot. So uh, it was a fun fun way to put into, into practice what I've been testing for so long with those training what, exercises. What lens was that again? And this was the 17 millimeter F1.8 on the Olympus Pen F. Okay. So again, that's kind of like my de facto street shooting kit on Olympus is the smallest camera body I can get which for me is the Pen F and the uh, F1.8 primes. So if I'm packing for the streets of Chicago, it's going to be the, the 17 millimeter F1.8, the 12 millimeter F2, and the 75 millimeter F1.8. Uh, I don't like to get up into people's faces to shoot street photography so much. With the 75 millimeter, I can sit a little ways back and kind of poach shots of people uh, out in the streets without having to feel like I'm interrupting their, their life by doing so. Um, 
Michael McLean is asking how long are you asking how long on the live composite of the star trails? That was pretty brief. So the star trail shot, I think that that live composite probably ran for 15 minutes, maybe something like that. It wasn't very long. Uh, that's why you don't have a ton of rotation in the stars. Uh, it looks like there's a lot of rotation just because of the number of stars in there, but I was in a pretty dark area as well. So that's probably why it looks like it was a little longer than it, than it was. And that's it in those. I've got a few more images I guess I can share just to keep the momentum going here. And I can talk about this one, or the reason I brought this one up uh, is specifically to talk about composition. So I'm always looking for leading lines. And sometimes when you get out to shoot, leading lines aren't obvious right away. Uh, and at first glance, driving down the road, I saw these wildflowers growing and thought, you know, I, I love the way that the sky is starting to light up as the sun is setting. We've got drama in that. But how do I compose this with this big just field of weeds and wildflowers? And started walking along the edge of the field with the camera up to my eye just not focusing on anything in particular, almost just letting your eyes sort of defocus and looking for things that define direction in the scene. And what I ended up coming up with is there's a row, the flowers, the yellow flowers towards the center of the frame almost give you this sense of direction here. And they coincide with the way the clouds are kind of coming out as you as well. So the, the flowers line up with where the sun is setting, the clouds kind of have that same general sense of, movement and direction as the line of flowers do maybe not the uh maybe not the fanciest set of leading lines but there was enough there for i think me to to work it into my composition with that and this was shot I, with go ahead oh i don't know jamie i think you like um i can't use your mouse but just to the right of your flower there's like that little depression off to the right corner right of your frame just like you have on the left side yep. and, and that kind of leads into the line of the cloud just off to the left. So if you start bottom right and you move up to the top left, mm -hmm. um, you know, I see like that line that it almost connects entirely with that cloud section right there. Um, so uh, it might not be a leading line per se, but it definitely has like the whole triangle thing going on. And I sure. know triangles are big in photos. Yep. So I, I definitely see that, that connection right there. Very cool. Uh, so that was shot with the OMD EM1 mark two and the seven to 14 millimeter probably at seven millimeters really wide on the wide end of that one uh the next shot is a perfect example of why i always have a camera in my car uh, i love storms i like stormy weather i'm always looking for that moment that i can catch either before or after the storm so this was after the weather had moved past and been chasing rainbows all year and hadn't gotten a rainbow shot and then finally got the opportunity to uh, to be able to capture a rainbow and looking for anything in the scene. I didn't want a big open field with nothing in it. And all I could see was this derelict looking oil rig out in a field that had an access road to it. So I just kind of jetted out there and just threw that in the frame. I wanted something in the frame aside from just the rainbow. And I thought this is the perfect juxtaposition between the beauty of nature and just kind of the gritty dirtiness of mankind with this rusted out oil rig in the field this was shot with the uh omd em1x and the 7 to 14 millimeter uh, no filters on that lens so this was kind of enhanced a bit in post to bring out the uh to bring out the rainbow if i had a different lens set up with me uh circular polarizer is a good thing to shoot rainbows with as well uh, it kind of works in the same way that it would if you were shooting uh, to get your skies bluer if you rotate your circular polarizer when you're looking at a rainbow, you can make the rainbow darn near disappear, or you can make the colors really start to pop out and be more vibrant. So that's just kind of a recommendation for shooting rainbows. Uh, next one, again, reoccurring theme for a lot of my photography is that barn that I photograph. And it's again, it's another one of those things. People are asking for things that we could do during this shutdown period of time. Find a subject and get to know it well and then start shooting that subject as often as you can in different lighting conditions, different atmospheric conditions, different seasons, et cetera. And I've been photographing this barn for nearly a decade. And initially it was just going out there and shooting when I was bored. And then it was going out and shooting when I had an idea 
And now I actually have a shot list that I've developed over the years of things that I want to accomplish out at that barn. And I've been checking them off the list as I go. Uh, probably EM1 Mark II with this one and the, the 12 millimeter F2. And another thing I like to do too, landscape photo shot and portrait orientation. I love including a lot of sky in my scenes. Uh, what Photoshop program do I use? So I am primarily a Lightroom and Photoshop only person. And I use the Creative Cloud Suite. 90% uh, of my work is done in Lightroom. Uh, mostly done through hue, saturation, and luminance sliders, uh, contrast adjustments, and tone curves. And that's about it for, for the majority of it. If I do jump into Photoshop, um, and I don't have, none of, the, none of the images here would have it. Um, if I jump into Photoshop though, it's usually going to be to remove something from a scene. I loathe uh, power lines. <laughs> I've been told so many times, work the power lines into your scene. You know, they tell part of the story. Nah, for me, they just drive me insane and I try to get them out. So, but those are the two pieces of software I use, Lightroom and Photoshop. And I'll tinker around in On One and Luminar on occasion. So the next shot, uh, I think everybody probably recognizes this if you're from Michigan, it's Point Betsy. Uh, challenging, always trying to shoot the Milky Way and try and get exposures right, especially when you have something bright like a lighthouse here. I uh, really struggle with having movement. It was a windy evening, which it seems like it always is whenever I'm at Point Betsy. So the leaves on the trees were blowing around quite a bit. But if you're looking for a place to get out and be able to see the Milky Way, I highly recommend making the drive up to Point Betsy. It's just stunningly beautiful and the Milky Way is visible to the naked eye up there, clear as day. Uh, and we're getting about to the season now also where you can do the drive up there and, and see it without having to be out ridiculously late. I think it's probably rising about three o'clock right now. And as the summer goes on, the Milky Way rise will get earlier and earlier. So when the weather gets better, again, like Justin mentioned earlier though, Keep an eye on the lunar calendar. You don't want to go out if it's anything a half moon or or more. Uh, it just washes the Milky Way out, and it's so hard, so hard to see. Yeah, and and you just have to be mindful of where uh, the moon is at. Sometimes the moon can be, you know, a crescent or something like when it's when it's waning, mm -hmm. and it's, sometimes it's already set well before it's it's even out. So um, it just depends on what side. Typically, when it's when it's waxing, um, yeah, you it just even after you get into the sliver of that crescent moon, it's just sometimes that can be too much light, depending on where it's at. Like sometimes depending on if it's still low in the sky, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a, it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, it is, it is tough, but I love point Betsy. I mean, there was one night we went out there and the, I mean, I could hold my hands out from side to side, my wingspan. And that's like visually looking in front of me. That's where the Milky way was. Yeah. And, and I just thought that, uh, the man, man, that was, it was just amazing. And it was like the clearest night that we had ever been up there. I, I went up there with Kenny and we actually saw the Northern lights. That was nice. last year or, or two years ago when they said, Oh, it'll be, it'll be happening Friday and Saturday. We went up Thursday, Thursday. night. <laughs> yep. And I said, I said, they're always wrong. Go up a night before. Yep. And, and we drove up and he's like, man, I've never seen it this dark up here, Justin. And we get out there and it's like, you walk to the beach Milky Way is as large as life. And it was really odd because driving up there, you could see like it looked like a, a huge just wall of clouds from the horizon all the way up into the air. Mm -hmm. and, and Kenny's <laughs> like, well, that's well, that's uh, that looks like a storm bank. I said, nope, that's moisture in the atmosphere. And if anything, it's just going to I think it what it did towards the end of the night is it just magnified everything that we were seeing because it essentially becomes a lens in the sky. The only negative thing was towards the end of the night, all that moisture drops down. So our, our lenses and stuff by like one or two in the morning, were just like sopping wet. Oh yeah. yeah just, just terrible. <laughs> For sure. Not very cool. Well, what do you say about ready to cut this thing off? I think we've been going for about 90 minutes now. Uh, it's been a yeah. lot of fun for sure. Uh, no, any last cool. minute questions from anybody? Speak now or forever hold your peace, people. Right. Uh, I will take this opportunity, too, though, to just kind of throw out uh, some of my social handles for people who don't follow me. You can look me up on Instagram and on Twitter just by searching for MacDonald underscore photo. 
Uh, just give me a follow over there and kind of keep you up to date on things that I've got going on. Uh, also, I do a podcast every other Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with another Olympus educator, Mike Baining. And the name of that podcast is called Mirrorless Minutes. Uh, we broadcast live on YouTube and on our Facebook page, which you can search for just Mirrorless Minutes and find us that way as well. And I'm not done plugging yet. Uh, I also do workshops with a few different people. I had one scheduled for the 13th of this month, which obviously is not happening. We've moved, since moved that to October, the second week in October down in Hocking Hills. If you're interested in workshops with us, um, you can just swing over to meetup.com forward slash mirrorless adventures. Uh, and don't let the name fool you just because we are mirrorless adventures doesn't mean DSLR users can't go. Um, everybody can go. It doesn't matter what system you shoot with. Uh, we did a workshop in Moab, Utah last year at Arches National Park. And I think half of the users were Olympus. The other half were Sony and other camera systems as well. So we are system agnostic when it comes to education. So if you're interested in workshops, uh, swing over to meetup.com forward slash mirrorless adventures and just sign up over there and you'll be notified whenever we list new workshops. Because of all of the social distancing and and everything being shut down this the majority of this workshop season is kind of a bust so i'm spending this time planning out the 2021 workshop season uh i mentioned earlier a trip to iceland that's supposed to happen in june uh, if that goes through that is also a scouting location for a 2021 workshop in iceland for those that are interested that will be a very small workshop probably limited limited to five people or less uh, so it'll be very exclusive, very one-on-one, -on -one, uh, intimate workshop in Iceland. So if you're interested in those kinds of things, furthering your education, don't forget to check us out on meetup.com forward slash mirrorless adventures. And I guess I can throw anything in there. I, even though the store may be closed to the general public, you guys, um, we're working on getting our website up. That's what we're using this uh, this downtime to do. Um, if you guys need anything equipment wise, uh, don't hesitate to call. I'm still there uh, between 10 and two to get you guys equipment if you need it. Uh, the number is 231-733-1286. You can always hit us up on our Facebook page with a on our business page, uh, Camera Shop Muskegon. Um, I respond to that uh, on the regular, check that every day just to make sure everyone's taken care of. Um, so if you have any questions or anything, uh, 10 to 2, you can find me there. And uh, thanks to Jamie's help uh, getting me rolling on uh, streaming here. Um, I'm hoping to uh, get some online classes, uh, even our photo meetup group, uh, into the, uh, the wireless, um, what do you call this realm of things, Jamie? Just um, live, live streaming, live broadcast. The remote education. <laughs> yeah, remote remote education. So, um, yeah, and if you guys like this, um, uh, Jamie, were we going to try to do this next Sunday? or? Yeah, or this, this could be our normal Sunday routine until um, until we're all released from our, our quarantines, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we're happy to do this for you guys. I mean, this is something that we're both passionate about. I, um, I, I know I just... I love talking tech um, since I'm not doing it during the week. This is the only time I get to run my mouth and, um, <laughs> you know, and, and hopefully it's worth something to somebody. That's, that's the biggest thing. So yep. that's what I, that's what I would like yeah. to see come from all of this is that uh, at least a handful of people walk away with some sort of information that they didn't mm -hmm. have when they arrived. And like Justin said, so we'll do this next Sunday. We'll plan on uh, 2 PM start time, just like we did today. Uh, that gives you a week to come up with questions, comments, suggestions, uh, any kind of requests you have. I think from either one of us, we're both open on social media to reach oh, yeah. out to. So uh, again, search me out on Facebook. If you want to be photo buddies, just look for Jamie A. McDonald and add me a friend request. And then we can chat back and forth about what you want to see on next week's show. Oh, and the other thing, Jamie, I should, uh, we should challenge everyone on is, uh, don't just bring your questions, but like church, um, it's your job next week to bring one or two friends to our live stream next week. <laughs> it's like, Good like call. bring your friend to church. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good call. All right. With that said, I guess we'll uh, hit the big red end broadcast button and we'll see you guys seven days from now. Take care. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in guys.